How far would you go for your significant other? Would you eat the food she likes? Move to a city he loves? Would you change religions? If your man were big into blackmail, would you participate? If you're joining us for the first time, this is episode six in a series. Kate, Melody, and Nancy have been exploring a family mystery involving Aunt Susie, whose family house and barn burned down in 1912. This was soon after she was shipped off to a school for girls. We found out that Frank Hamilton was arrested for harming Susie, but was there a trial? We think all of these things are related, and we think this fire marked the beginning of this family's downward spiral into intermittent homelessness. We've hired a genealogist to help us find out more, and we're anxiously awaiting her findings. It's 2018. The Me Too movement goes global. Sears and Roebuck goes bankrupt. And I receive a 54-page packet of court papers in the mail. The genealogist tells me that these are preliminary court papers. Most of these are handwritten in a really fast scribble. Chicken scratch legalese. And they are incomplete. What does she mean by incomplete? Well, they do suggest that a trial occurred, but they do not say what happened at the trial. There are papers about the original arrest, about the trial being rescheduled to a later date, subpoenas for witnesses to appear, and some curious pre-trial testimony from Ruth Hamilton. I have to switch glasses, magnify the writing on the big screen, and reread this really bad handwriting several times, but fortunately, I have some experience reading Chicken Scratch. It's 1978. The TV show Dallas debuts on CBS. Everyone at school is singing, You're the one that I want, after watching Grease for the third time. And the Reverend Jim Jones shocks the world, leaving us all with a new saying, Don't drink the Kool-Aid. I'm 19 years old. I'm working my first college job grading freshman comp papers. These are handwritten, scribbled, chicken scratch. And I get a lot of practice reading really bad handwriting. And throughout the semester, a parade of young men come through the English department doors in search of homework help, and one of these boys asks me out on a date. I end up changing college majors because of him. I follow him to another town. I even get a job where he works. And one Saturday night, he takes me out to dinner at our favorite Chinese restaurant. He says he has something important to discuss. He reaches into his pocket. Is he about to propose? I hold my breath as he extends his hands and opens it to reveal the key to my apartment. He says he needs to give it back because he has just proposed to his other girlfriend. And she said yes. And that's when I realize my man picker is malfunctioning, broken down, in need of an upgrade. Like grandmother, like granddaughter. And now I wonder, if I had married that man after changing my major and following him to another town, how much would I have been willing to do to keep him happy? Watch his TV shows? Raise kids his way? Blackmail the neighbor of his choice? It's 1888. Imagine Annie Hubbard, 19 years old, at a neighborhood barn dance in Mars, Nebraska. Chet Fields plays the fiddle. His brother Ed is there too, and when the Fields brothers play, all the young people come. The air crackles with a mixture of nerves and excitement, and Annie tugs at the faded ribbon in her hair as she watches him across the rough-hewn dance floor. The new boy, with his sun-streaked hair and the beginnings of a shy smile. Then she sees him, shouldering his way through the crowd. Hello, I'm Charlie. Would you like to dance? I don't know if that's what happened, but dances were really popular in the area, and so was Chet Fields and his fiddle. By March of 1889, these two young people must have found a meeting spot much more private than a public dance hall. According to her divorce papers, Annis Hubbard and Charles Scholes got married on October 9, 1889, and then he deserted her on October 9, 1889. Daughter Florence was born on December 31, 1889. So it looks to me like Annie and Charlie never really planned to live together. 
and I don't know if Florence ever met him or his second family. And you know that little voice I mentioned last episode, the one that says, you're no good, you should be ashamed, you need to know your place? How loud do you think that voice gets in the head of an unwed pregnant girl in 1889? Or a divorced lady with a small child? So when Orly Carver came along willing to marry her, did Annie feel like she had many choices? Don't you want to just travel back in time, take her by the shoulders and shout, Grandma, think this through? What do we really know about Annie? Well, not a lot. Childhood stories suggest that the Hubbard children were playful with a tendency towards mischief and that they had a solid education in Vermont before arriving in Nebraska. Not a college education, but good for the times. Dad said that Annie was not particularly demonstrative. Orly was more affectionate when he wasn't being violent. Dad also said that Annie had a lot of anxiety in later years and that once she almost gave up on life. It was some time after that fire in a little spider-infested stone house in Kansas, the house that leaked like a sieve, where she tried to hang herself from the rafters, but Uncle Bob cut her down. Bob would have been quite young still, perhaps nine or ten. Bob also tells of her calmly removing my dad, little Willie, from the middle of the bed when he was a toddler so that she could shoot a rattlesnake that she saw hanging from the rafters directly above where he slept. Dad wrote about Annie's actions during the 1918 influenza epidemic when she spent countless hours caring for sick neighbors. We've heard that in the years after the fire, Annie's children were often dirty and unkempt, that she was often sick, and that she had a tendency to forget what years her children were born when reporting their ages to school authorities or to coroners. And what was her relationship with Orly? From Dad's description, Orly was in charge and Annie's job was to follow along. At the end of her life, Annie lost a battle with colorectal cancer. She was 56 years old, and when the kids visited the hospital, they report that she was incoherent, probably from pain medication. I don't think that's how she would like to be remembered. I'd rather remember her as the lady who shot down the rattlesnake. Annie, get your gun. But now we have a new story from Ruth Hamilton. Ruth paints Annie in a very different light. Of course, just like that dance story that I made up a few paragraphs back, we have no idea how much of Ruth's story is true. It's 1911, September 12. Annie is a mother of eight. She's been living with Orly for 14 years. The Hamiltons are neighbors. And here is what Ruth Hamilton says in her pre-trial testimony. She says that Mrs. Carver came to the Hamilton home after dinner and asked to speak to her husband, Frank, who was upstairs resting. Frank came down. Then Mrs. Carver said, I am going to send you over the road for having Susie out all night, but I am willing to settle if you will give me your gray team. Ruth asked Mrs. Carver if Frank had done anything wrong or harmed Susie in any way, and Mrs. Carver said that he had not, but that he had Susie out all night, and that was against the law, and that she would send him over the road for it unless Frank gave her that gray team. According to Ruth, when the Hamiltons turned Mrs. Carver down, she then said she would be willing to settle for the Bay Colts, which were inferior to the gray team, not worth as much money. And when they refused to part with either the Greys or the Bays, Mrs. Carver proclaimed in a loud and angry voice, I will make it hot for you and send you over the road. Ruth goes on to testify that Carver and his wife live on a Kincaid homestead not far from the Hamiltons, and that on several occasions they've offered to trade the entire homestead for that Gray team. And finally, Ruth says that she ran into Mrs. Carver in front of the drugstore in O'Neill on the same day after the preliminary hearing, and she said to her then, I hope you feel better since you swore to all those lies. Whereupon, Mrs. Carver started to cry and answered, I had to do it. And if you were in my place, you would do it. Okay, where do I start? Everybody seems to agree that Frank had Susie out all night. Had her out where? What would a middle-aged man be doing out all night with a 13-year-old girl that falls into the category of not harmful? Astronomy lessons? Feeding homeless cattle? 
I've racked my brain. And what about the language here? Would somebody with grandma's education level use phrases like, I will make it hot for you, or I will send you over the road? Maybe. Then there's this whole thing about the horses. The carvers would do anything to get those grays. Would a set of horses really be worth an entire 600-acre homestead? I don't know. And I'm remembering comments Kate used to hear from the family years ago. The carvers were nothing but a bunch of horse thieves. I didn't think they meant literal horse thieves, but maybe they did. And finally, back to the language. I will make it hot for you. I will send you over the road. Doesn't this sound like something we should put on a set of travel mugs? Christmas presents coming up. So 2018 was an eventful year. With all of these court papers and this new story about Grandma, newspapers started to be digitized at a faster and faster pace, and I talked to Cousin Melody for the very first time. You know that surgery I mentioned back in Episode 1? It's Melody's fault I got that surgery to start with. So if you want to hear more, check back next time. Thanks to Amy Johnson Crow for providing a framework for people who don't know what to say when writing about genealogy. We're loosely following her 52 Ancestors in 52 Weeks framework. For more information about that, to see a copy of Ruth's court testimony, and for all of my documentation regarding Florence's birth year, please go to LegacyCarpers.com. Look for The Susie Situation, Episode 6.